Welcome to our fourth and final section of this chapter as we focus on political participation. Uh, we are starting uh, this chapter in a new unit, American Political Ideologies and Beliefs, uh, and our focus here is on Chapter 7 uh, in the online PDF textbook. If you're in the hard copy textbook, that's Chapters 4 and 8. Uh, we've been talking about public opinion, ideologies, participation and voting and in this chap in this section of the chapter we're going to be looking at political participation uh, we know that the most common form is voting of course um, but are there other ways that we can participate in politics and there are there are many ways uh, that we can participate in politics today including uh, voting and in unit five we'll look at even in even more depth about political participation unit five is all about political participation using things like linkage institutions and the media and outside groups and the role of of money in those groups and campaigns and campaign finance um, and so uh, unit five is all is going to be all about that uh, in those terms uh, in terms of participation but some things we can do uh, in terms of uh, beyond voting uh, uh, we vote, uh, and and definitely uh, we carry that out. Uh, we don't vote as much as we would sometimes like. Although in 2020 it was record voting uh, because of the mail-in balloting and and eliminating the barriers uh, to voting that we saw across the country. Uh, we see a lot. We saw a lot more voting uh, in a lot of places, in most places uh, than we saw normally. Um, but uh, we can join interest groups. We can uh, go to political rallies or join protests. We can uh, ring doorbells and knock on doors, um, as I shared in my story uh, with uh, with uh, working on campaigns. Uh, we can uh, tell friends and use social media uh, to support candidates and and tell friends and family and, and colleagues uh, about candidates that we support. Uh, we can sign petitions. Heck, we can start petitions. Uh, we can also write letters and call in um, to our elected officials and tell them uh, when there are issues that are important to us, things we want to carry out. Uh, we can have them write letters and, 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 um, and or we can write letters and call and and uh, share those types of things um, so that we can show them uh, how important these issues are to us. Uh, we can call into talk shows and um, and address the um, uh, the the audiences of these uh, talk shows to talk about the issues that are important to us to bring them to the forefront uh, of of the issues that we care about. We can protest, and again, this is peaceful protest. Um, the idea of protesting or going to rallies or or um, uh, carrying signs or standing uh, on street corners with signs to protest uh, particular aspects of, of participation. Again, peacefully in nature. We can donate to campaigns and to candidates, to political parties and interest groups, and we can uh, vote with our dollars in um, in taking these uh, many places. And uh, and and the uh, the the magic of the internet has definitely helped uh, to ex extend our participation in politics. Um, it has definitely helped. Uh, us do more of those types of things in terms of uh, in terms of that uh, that voter participation. Uh, we see this time and again in terms of how we uh, participate outside of voting in campaigns and campaign activities. Uh, things like giving money to help a, help a campaign or or um, signing up or subscribing to a newsletter, uh, voting of course, and and trying to persuade others to do the same. Uh, this is part of our our political efficacy. The idea of our, 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 be able, our knowledge of knowing what's going on in government and being able to take part in that, uh, being able to look at uh, the importance of, of, of that efficacy and, uh, and stressing that uh, knowledge of government and knowledge of what's going on and being able to address it in terms of voting. It is the most common political activity that people participate in. And the turnout is highest in our presidential elections. Uh, we see more voting there than any other. Uh, voting in a presidential general election is the most common form um, uh, because of the fact that uh, people turn out highest to vote there. It is the one that gets the most press. It gets the most coverage, the most uh, conversation. Uh, and that's why we see more people voting in um, presidential elections in, in uh, November uh, of presidential election years than in any other uh, elections that are held. Um, now, uh, it's interesting uh, we talk about voting because uh, the idea of the Constitution was really uh, that uh, we have an electoral college that kind of carries out the selection of the president. But states are the ones that really run elections. Um, the uh, the idea uh, of of uh, the Constitution stepping in and and uh, allowing people to vote uh, really was a new concept 
uh, with the um, advent of the Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, we saw that many states, uh, New Jersey being the exception, uh, prohibited women from voting. Uh, until the 19th Amendment came along in 1920. Um, we saw uh, also limits on, on property ownership. If you wanted to vote, you had to own property. Uh, you had to be a white male. Um, and that's where we got the uh, the grandfather clause, the white primaries and, and the like uh, that we talked about in the last chapter. Um, and then we start to see with the 15th Amendment, uh, giving black men the right to vote in the 15th Amendment, um, we start to see uh, the, the Congress, the, the government, stepping in to pass amendments and uh, laws to close loopholes, uh, things um, like we mentioned, giving women the right to vote in the 19th Amendment and, um, and um, giving D.C. the right to vote in a presidential election in the 23rd, giving them three electoral votes. We eliminate poll taxes in the 24th Amendment. Um, and in the 26th Amendment, we give those who are going to fight in Vietnam uh, the right to vote. If they're 18, 19, and 20, why don't they have the right to vote? Um, it didn't increase their voter participation any more than any other age group, uh, but now they had the right to vote as a result of that expansion. And that was done at the national level when states are really running elections. Um, it wasn't until the Reconstruction era that we really saw um, the uh, the national government stepping in to uh, to add those things. And notice those are amendments to Constitution. Um, those are amendments that are taking place, not just congressional laws uh, that we see there. Uh, a lot of congressional activity over those hundred years uh, that are taking shape. Now, uh, the, the question always comes up, how easy do we make it to actually vote? Uh, and in some cases, very easy. In others, very difficult uh, in, in that regard. And so a voter registration is one that always crops up. Uh, there is a state that doesn't require voter registration, uh, that you can actually walk right in and vote. Uh, if you uh, can, uh, can uh, show proof of ID or whatever, um, that you uh, are a resident of that state, of that county, of that, that township or whatever, you can vote. Uh, and that is uh, North Dakota uh, that has that, that, uh, that ability. Uh, all other states require some level of voter registration. Um, in the state of Maryland, it is a closed uh, voter registration in that closed primaries are held. You have to be a member of either a Democratic or Republican party in order to vote in their, um, in their primary elections, um, as opposed to other states that are more open primary, uh, where you go in and you vote, um, you can select a ballot, um, uh, Virginia was an open primary state. Indiana is an open primary state. Uh, you go in, you select the ballot of the day, and you vote in that primary. Um, uh, but uh, much voter registration was meant, uh, was created to discourage voting. Uh, and um, and unfortunately, what does voter registration mean? That's one question I always get. Um, voter registration is the idea that you have to kind of pre-register in order to vote. Um, you have to, they want to go through and make sure that you are the, the uh, resident of the area that you're voting in and that you're eligible to vote in that area. Uh, and so in order to do that, they uh, will clear you for voter registration. They'll send you a nice little voter registration card. And, um, and then on election day, uh, you can go in and vote at the polls and uh, they will allow you to vote. Now, uh, there's a lot of costs to this voter registration. Obviously, it's a, another step in the process. Um, that is going to take um, uh, resources in the government in terms of carrying that out. So there are costs. Uh, but in terms of citizens voting, uh, it's not in money that we see the cost. It's in their time and effort. And it discourages people, especially when there are long lines, especially when uh, machines break down and even longer lines. Uh, many people give up and say, I I'm not going to wait this long. I, I I don't want to vote that badly. Uh, and so they walk away and their vote never counts. Uh, and, and that's really sad to me uh, that someone um, would uh, go through all of that effort and then just walk away. Uh, but I can also understand people who have lives and jobs and, and um, are voting in an urban area where there's not enough voting machines and the machines that are there are breaking down. Uh, and that's just an injustice that needs to be resolved, that, that uh, we, we owe people better across the country, across the entire country in terms of, of doing better uh, in, the, in that regard. Um, and um, automatic registration is what um, uh, some democracies have. We don't have it much here, uh, but some also have automatic registration and mandatory voting. In Australia, you will get a fine if you don't vote. Um, I remember when I was down there and, and talking to citizens that were there, and they're like, usually people who don't want to vote uh, just pay the fine. It's not a significant amount of money, uh, but they just pay the fines. So they don't have to vote. Uh, but voting is mandatory. Uh, it is essentially like a tax in that you pay 
not to vote uh, in that regard. Uh, and then um, the idea there um, is that turnout is much lower uh, than in some countries in which registration is not required uh, in those uh, in those places uh, with automatic registration um, uh, because of of uh, the idea that uh, there's no you never signed up for anything you don't really feel a part of something uh, and unfortunately you're um, you're you're not um, you're not feeling like you have skin in the game in terms of uh, your vote really matters and and that's the uh, the sad part of efficacy right uh, because many people feel like uh, well what has the government done for me what is the government going to do for me well uh, nothing so why do I vote why does it matter my vote's not going to count my vote's not going to matter I'll stay home and wash the cat and that is what we never want to get voters uh, in the mindset of doing uh, so uh, you can see here this is a voter registration application from the state of Maryland uh, in terms of parts you you would select in number 10, you could select which party uh, you want to vote in that primary. Uh, so it's not just Democrat and Republican. You can vote Libertarian or Green Party, Independent Party, Constitution Party. I think they have a couple of others now uh, that can be added to that. Uh, you sign uh, your name and you sign the affidavit there. Um, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, you can have same-day registration uh, for voter registration to register to vote. Uh, I mentioned North Dakota being the only state that doesn't have any type of registration like that. Um, some states require photo ID. Uh, Maryland does not, um, but in some states, in Virginia, I believe they do, uh, and, and uh, states in the South uh, have required, some states have required voter ID. Um, we do sign up as a result of the motor voter law. We do sign up people when they um, get their driver's license. You can register to vote right there. When you renew your driver's license, you can register to vote. Um, those are great ways to connect with um, uh, people, new voters that haven't had a chance to sign up, and a great and an easy way to get them registered to vote, which is uh, really helpful, and that definitely improves improved uh, people's ability to uh, register to vote, not necessarily voting anymore, uh, but registering to vote as a result uh, of what we see there. Um, and, um, and then uh, this new California law, uh, automatic registration. When you get a driver's license, you're automatically registered to vote. We'll see how that plays out in terms of, uh, of whether that improves um, the uh, number of people actually go to the polls and vote. Uh, as a result of that automatic registration. But uh, but what do we see over time? Uh, we see voter turnout in midterms versus voter turnout in presidentials. Uh, and you can see that people vote in presidential elections more than midterms. Who wants to turn out for a midterm? Well, the uh, attentive public turn out for midterms. Um, but it is uh, a lot more people, including the, the know-nothings and including the uh, the. Uh, latent voters uh, that um, that will come out to vote in those presidential elections. So uh, presidential elections are alive and well, still very popular uh, in that regard in terms of the uh, the voter turnout that we see there. And again, uh, among voting eligible population from 1972 to 2016, uh, we saw uh, that the voter eligible um, in a presidential year much higher, without a doubt, uh, versus uh, the uh, midterms. Uh, the midterms in the orange there and the the um, presidential elections in the green. Much more uh, uh, larger, a much larger turnout in um, presidential election years. So um, in terms of voting, uh, just some uh, some highlights here. Uh, the U.S. does hold more elections than anybody else. Uh, think about it. We have, uh, what, 50,000 different types of governments uh, from townships to town councils to city councils to county councils um, to state governments uh, and, um, and everywhere in between, all across the United States, across the 50 states. Um, and, uh, and the idea here is that um, many voters kind of pick and choose what they're voting in. Uh, usually if there's an issue that is important to them, they're going to vote in those local elections. Otherwise, they're going to take a pass. They're not going to know as much about them. So uh, that's a, one of the reasons why uh, people uh, tend to skip those, because I don't know who's on the ballot down there, and I've never heard of this guy. Who is that? Um, so uh, and presidential elections get all the coverage. Uh, so they kind of suck the oxygen out of the room. Uh, and so that's why uh, turnout is much higher, because it gets a lot more coverage. Um, and midterms and primaries uh, are going to have a lot less turnout in terms of what we see there. Uh, what we call the off-year elections, um, uh, this is the idea that uh, you have a, a, a off-year election in which um, there's local elections taking place or um, uh, you have the, um, uh, the, the mid midterms, if you will. Um, these are uh, these are less attended by voters, um, and usually, uh, in some places, as few as you know, 10% of the of the uh, eligible voters actually 
make the determination as to who wins. Uh, in some cases, it's really low uh, for, for some of the uh, local offices, uh, which is really sad because um, a lot of them are really uh, getting their political start uh, as a result of that. And then we have special elections. The idea of uh, if somebody dies or resigns, they take a job with the uh, administration and in, in the uh, executive branch, and so a seat comes up and you got to fill the seat, so uh, you have a special election, uh, and different states, again, states conduct elections, so states determine how those special elections are carried out. Um, so who's more likely to vote here? Uh, think about it, and, and you can pause the video here and taking a look. Uh, is it college graduates or non-college graduates? Is it older Americans or younger Americans? Churchgoers versus non-churchgoers? Um, pause the video here, and then uh, we'll show you the results. Okay, let's take a look and see how you did. Were you right? College graduates uh, do vote more than non-college graduates, older versus younger Americans. Uh, those who attend church are more likely to vote. Uh, women are more likely to vote, as are whites and uh, the wealthier, as well as uh, those uh, in uh, rural areas like the Midwest. Um, uh, that tend to vote more likely uh, in, in those spaces. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody votes in those areas. It doesn't mean uh, that, that there aren't going to be more voters in an urban area than in a, a Midwest region, um, but it does mean uh, that they are more likely to vote if we have to generalize uh, those particular groups. Uh, and what we see here uh, is the, uh, the youth vote, the Republican youth vote, the Democratic youth vote, uh, and then voting for third parties. Uh, so we can see time and again uh, the differences in terms of uh, this is just a, the youth vote in terms of those aged 18 to 29 that are voting in presidential elections. Uh, and we can see there are some exceptions um, um, in terms of the, uh, the reds and the blues. Looks like they voted for Reagan and George, w, or George Herbert Walker Bush, excuse me, in 1988. Um, and otherwise, uh, they supported Democrats, uh, and by some close margins there in 2000, if you will, um, very close in 1980 even. Um, but the uh, the idea is the the youth vote tends to be more uh, supportive of Democrats than Republicans, with a few outliers, as we can see here. Um, and third parties uh, don't really get the youth vote. Uh, we saw a little bit of that in 1992, um, in terms of. Uh, the uh, third party vote, Ross Perot running um, as the Reform Party candidate there. So how do we get out the vote? GOTV, if you've ever heard of it, uh, is get out the vote. And the idea is how do we uh, drum up the uh, support uh, to get base voters out and to turn people out who are going to vote for our candidates? Well, we, it, we basically use all hands on deck and all of the above, okay? Uh, so postcards and phone calls and... Um, and we get buses and we get people uh, to support them and call them and encourage them. And we put flyers on their doors and we um, send them mailers and we do everything we can uh, to encourage those people to come out and vote. And we don't necessarily know that they're going to vote for our candidate, but we can get a pretty good idea based on demographics, based on data that we'll talk about in the next chapter uh, in terms of how people vote and, uh, and, and where. Uh, people are voting. Uh, so that definitely helps tremendously, but we really try and drive that get out the vote. And even during the pandemic, uh, we definitely saw an increase in, in get out the vote efforts in new ways. Uh, we had a lot of mail-in voting going on, and so trying to reach people was much harder to do. Uh, you had to rely on more uh, internet-based methods. That didn't work so much in Texas, but it did in Georgia. Uh, and we can see the um, the get out the vote efforts uh, really having an impact. Now, uh, the voters that we cannot reach, uh, that we try and try again, uh, this is the hashtag wa don't wash the cat voter, okay? Uh, this is the voter that comes up with any excuse to stay home. I've got to stay home and wash the cat. No, you don't. Uh, get out and vote. Okay, we always have those apathetic voters, people that are more interested in other things uh, than voting, don't really see that it matters, um, don't really see how their vote is making a difference, uh, and so they stay home. They come up with any and every reason they can not to vote. I got to pick up the kids, I got to pick up the dry cleaning, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to go pay the bills, oh, I got to um, stay home and wash the cat. Uh, we've heard all of the reasons why people don't vote. But if you don't vote, your voice is not heard. Uh, and so that's why it's so important that you vote. And uh, not just vote. Run for office. Do it. Um, 
and uh, and and make change. Uh, you will um, you will not regret it. Now uh, we also don't make it easy to vote. Uh, we know that mail-in voting um, it, it really contributed to a significant increase in voting uh, in this 2020 election year. Um, but uh, we don't make it easy to vote. Uh, there are already uh, legislatures in in the works to dial back that mail-in voting. Um, why would you do that? I never understood. Why would you want to keep someone from voting? Why would you want to keep someone from exercising the the one voice they have? Um, but we do this a lot. We uh, we hold elections on weekdays um, when people have to work, when people can't get off work to stand in line for three hours in order to vote, cast their vote. Um, the voting hours are very limited. In many places, it's uh, nine or ten hours that the polls are open. And sometimes, uh, if somebody's working a shift and they have to drop off kids, um, where is their time uh, to drop off kids, work the shift, come back, get in line to vote? Uh, the polls are closed by then. Uh, so voting is very limited in that respect. And then early voting is so complicated, and there's so many different rules around around it, it doesn't make any sense sometimes in terms of, um, well, uh, this year the, the the rules are different. Well, uh, I didn't understand the rules last time when I tried to vote early. Um, and so, and, and they've eliminated some of those early voting uh, measures uh, over time. So um, it, it's confusing to a lot of people. And to people that aren't attentive public, that aren't paying attention to those details, uh, if you're not putting the information right in front of them, uh, they're just going to toss it aside. It's too much effort. It's too complicated. I, I don't need to worry about those things. And that really is the apathetic voter we're talking about here. Um, now, political scientists argue uh, that elections probably wouldn't change much if the apathetic voters actually did turn out. Some people say that um, people are happy with the way things are, and if they're not voting, then they're content. Uh, leave them alone. Uh, that, that They probably have the same or differing opinions as many of the voters that are already voting, part of the voting electorate already, and that there's uh, really no incentive or additional reasons to really bring out those voters, even though many people do try. Um, and especially for low information voters, well, maybe they're not going to vote the way you want them to anyway. Uh, so there's a lot of this back and forth. I say vote, vote, vote. Uh, get people out to vote and, and eliminate the barriers uh, to help people vote. It is, it is a, a democratic institution. It is a Republican form of government. It is important uh, to our democracy. Uh, let people vote. Why not? Uh, well, why don't people vote? Uh, and here are the apathetic voters once again. Oh, it's the weather. Believe it or not, weather really um, it comes up time and again. It doesn't get a lot of uh, attention in terms of being used as an excuse, uh, but it is. On, uh, on rainy days, um, uh, we see more Republicans win than Democrats uh, in general. Uh, on sunnier days um, or, or, or more um, general outlooks, uh, you see Democrats uh, uh, win in those, those circumstances because it depends on how badly do you want to vote. How badly do you want to vote for or against the people you're coming out to vote for or against? Um, uh, busyness is always the, the, the number one winner. Uh, oh, I've got, got conflicts with the schedule and that kind of thing. So we see lots of reasons for why uh, people don't vote. But the, um, uh, the, the, the main uh, argument is to get people to vote, get people out to vote. Um, some important factors and the three most important factors that we look for here uh, that determine how people vote. Party ID, uh, the appeal of the candidate is, a, is somebody that really appeals to someone. Do they have charisma? And what are the issues? What are the issues that we care about here? So party identification uh, is really the most important factor in how people vote. If uh, they are aligned with a party, uh, they are going to probably support the people in that party, okay? Um, unless they're independent, and we see rational choice is really starting to, to have a way towards that de-alignment uh, from the parties, more moderates, more independents, more people in the middle of the road. Um, but if they have a party ID, they tend to vote for the party ID. Uh, but as we see, elections are swinging back and forth more and more uh, these days because people don't have that party ID. That is a that is a game changer. Uh, that would be an interesting uh, political science um, a PhD project, really, to look at that sort of thing. Uh, candidate appeal. What charisma do they have? What's their dynamo, their energy? Uh, what kind of, uh, uh, of really um, uh, d uh, dynamic do they bring to the candidate in terms of uh, of how they, they uh, carry themselves and how they... Um, 
uh, approach uh, this election and this campaign. And then the issues. Um, obviously, people are interested in issues. And if the issues are controversial, if the issues are straightforward and people uh, are just um, – gung-ho about the issues, they're going to vote based on the issues. So those are three areas in which we definitely see uh, the most important factors in terms of how people vote. We also see what we call valence issues, uh, this idea of, uh, of issues in which uh, there's agreement. Everybody agrees. Um, and so uh, people are going to vote for whoever's most credible in terms of that agreement. If everybody's in agreement, then how do I differentiate between these candidates? Uh, that was something we heard a lot in the 2000 election. What's the difference between Al Gore and George W. Bush? Really don't see any differences between the two. Uh, we heard that a lot in that 2000 campaign. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, you can look back and look at, at a party ideology and, and – uh, and policy agenda and their party platforms and see a significant difference uh, in terms of how that plays out. But uh, but the idea there is that um, uh, the valence issues uh, lend themselves to the most credible candidates um, and um, these position issues are issues in which candidates um, don't always agree on positions. Uh, and that's where we get into wedge issues, uh, where we see wedge issues kind of take take shape and, and, and form here. Uh, because the wedge issues then are where areas where we split the candidates apart and we can kind of um, move ahead of the competition in, in terms of that. Uh, what have you done for me lately? What are you going to do for me? Um, this is These are two very popular approaches. We saw President Obama do this with prospective voting. Uh, what are you going to do for me in the future? How are you going to help versus retrospective voting. What have you done for me lately uh, in the last four years? Uh, President Reagan uh, appealed to voters in 1980 when he said, um, are you better off now than you were four years ago? That retrospective approach. What has Jimmy Carter done for you lately? Uh, and, and people appealed to that. Uh, are you better off than you were four years ago? And they said, no, we're not better off. Uh, we vote for change. Uh, so that's what we see here in terms of the retrospective versus prospective voting. Uh, if you remember nothing else about voting uh, from, this, from this section, remember that states run a elections. Uh, states are the ones who run elections, okay? It is Florida. It is Maryland. It is New Jersey. It is California. It is Texas. They are the ones that run their elections. They determine the systems that are used. They determine voter eligibility. The Supreme Court can step in and weigh something as constitutional or unconstitutional, uh, but who can, wh whose laws are they looking at? They're looking at state laws. They're looking at the state laws, and there's no perfect system out there. Um, all of them have flaws. All of them have advantages and disadvantages. We saw that in Florida. Uh, we, we've seen that in a number of systems that have been used. Um, but the idea here is states continue to run and conduct those elections. And, and that is um, how people vote, the most important aspect of political participation that we see today. I hope you found this helpful. This concludes Section 4, and we will see you coming up in the next chapter on demographics.